So we've talked about the role of experience. Uh, let's move on then and talk about the role of the church. Uh, the role of church history, the role of the church in general. Uh, how does that fit into this? Which we'll talk more about when we talk about the canonization of scripture. Um, but let's do talk about the role of the church. Um, so let's, let's talk about first the idea so the church. Um, let's talk first about the idea of traditionalism. Traditionalism. There's a difference between tradition and traditionalism. Traditionalism. Um, where the basis, the basis of our theology is the church as expressed in councils or popes. That's popes in union with the bishops, obviously. And tradition in general. Now, the basis for this, the basis for this is that Scripture is obscure. Scripture is obscure. Scripture is hard to understand. And so we need the church to interpret Scripture. Uh, the church makes explicit what Scripture leaves implicit. The church makes explicit what the Scriptures leave unclear. This gives way to the doctrine of the clarity of Scripture that we'll talk about later. Uh, the revelation of tradition, is what they would say, given to us in the apostles and then passed down through the church. So, so um, traditional traditionalism would say that the church doesn't create new teachings, but discovers what was already taught by the apostles. Okay, so, so the duty then is to interpret scripture in light of the tradition of the apostles and so uh, we can know what the scripture actually says. So this would be a, a two modes view of authoritative revelation. Okay, a two modes view. But in, in all honesty, um, they would say it comes back to the Bible alone. Um, so one would be Bible, and two would be tradition. Um, but but they would say it's tradition informed by the Bible. <clears throat> tradition informed by the Bible. Um, <clears throat> and they would see, though, they would see, though, in some sense, uh, this is one way that we could draw it, is tradition informed by the Bible. But in another sense, we could call it a one-mode view. A one-mode view. Because we could draw it like this, that within the idea of tradition is the Bible. And the Bible is a part of tradition, right? The whole that the apostles had given it to us. Um, let me, let's look at Second Thessalonians two fifteen. Okay, so this is this is the scriptural basis for this idea. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught by us, either by spoken word, or by our letter. Do you see it? By spoken word, or by letter. So, so the claim, so the claim would be that the apostles knew all the tradition, and some was written down, and some was preserved in just verbal format, and never written down, okay? So, so as the church developed her doctrine, um, tradition is growing out of scripture, um, with scripture as the foundation, or scripture as an expression of tradition, um, but there are things that were not written down, they were just passed down. What's your response to this? What do you think? Yeah. yeah, yeah, obviously some people are better able to read the Bible than others, otherwise we wouldn't have to get to teacher, right? Otherwise you wouldn't be at the pastor's college, right? You're learning how to read the Bible better. So obviously, um, there's ways to become better at reading the Bible and better at explaining it. So there is a truthfulness to that, right? <clears throat> that's, that's great. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, how do you know? How do you know what is tradition and what's not? You know, and a lot of times, a lot of times what you get is, you know, I can quote the church fathers just like Catholics can. Um, and if you read Luther, and if you read especially Calvin, I mean, Calvin is quoting the church fathers left and right, and he's telling the Catholic Church, you're not doing what the church fathers said, right? He's not just appealing to the Bible. He, he, he'll quote the church fathers just as much as the Bible. And his point is, you're not, you're not by your own standard, you're not, you're not doing what you say. Um, <clears throat> with that, and we, we mentioned this yesterday, 
Why the Bible? Why is the Bible our supreme source in determining all of our theology, right? If, if we say that it is, we need to be able to defend why. Um, and one of the primary reasons why is because God has chosen to preserve that special revelation, and he hasn't chose to preserve others, right? He chose to preserve that one in written form so that it can always be given. It's very clear what was said here, right? Um, yeah, so I think that being, it's, it, it, it immediately is in contrast to our doctrine of Scripture and the, the primacy of written verbal revelation, right? Um, so I think that'd be the biggest, the biggest problem. And then sh- how do you prove to me that this is what was taught by spoken word? How do you also not know that <clears throat> he's not just saying by spoken word is when they preach to them, right? Um, and how do you know that the spoken word isn't just explaining more of what was written down? How do you also know that everything written down is supposed to be scripture? Not all of Paul's letters are in the Bible. To, to form an entire doctrine of how I formulate my theology from this verse is, is quite a stretch, I think. Um, yeah, it's quite a stretch. But, but there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tendency within Protestants, I think, to react to this, which would be the, the view of anti-traditionalism. So there's traditionalism on one side, there's anti-traditionalism on the other, where the theo- theologian does his best to work alone. Theologian does his best to work Alone. Now, there's oftentimes great desires in this that the Bible be first and foremost. Um, but, uh, and they're well intended people. These are well intended people. Um, I, I've known a man, I've known a man once who denied the doctrine of eternal generation. He denied the doctrine of eternal generation because he says, Show me the words eternal generation in the Bible. And I said, like, Well, they're not there. I mean, like, we can theologize to get there, but the words eternal generation aren't there. And you know what? He ended up denying the Trinity eventually. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what Nicaea was all about. Um, not, Trinity means eternal generation of the Son. Um, for him, there was no distinction between the Father and the Son prior to the Incarnation, which means he denied the Trinity. Okay? Um, so here, here's, here's what's important, I think. Um, that we, we find a view of the church that's consistent with Scripture uh, and that's helpful in us doing our theology. Um, so there, there are right traditions. There are right traditions. Um, so let me, let me give you the primary tradition that's written in Scripture. Um, the primary tradition that we're, we hear about in Scripture is the gospel. Okay, look at this. So Matthew eleven twenty seven. All things have been handed over to me through the Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, except the Son. Uh, sorry, no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chose to reveal him, right? So there's a passing on from the Father to the Son. Um, all things have been handed over to me by the Father. It's then revealed to the apostles, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10. As it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. So the, like the apostles, or at least the scripture writers, right? We could say that. The scripture writers are receiving that. Then passed on to the church in general, 1 Corinthians 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of this gospel that I preach to you, Right? So the Father to the Son, the Son through the Spirit to the Scripture writers. Now I preach to you which you received and which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. Right? And do you see? The church here is meant to hold fast to this preached gospel. The church is meant to keep this tradition. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2.15 again. I think this is a better way to read it. Stand firm and hold to the tradition you were taught, either by spoken word or by our letter. What he's saying is hold fast to the gospel. Hold fast to the gospel is what he's saying. Uh, to guard against false teaching, Jude 3. 
Uh, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. What is that faith? It's the gospel. Defend the gospel. And we were meant to, 2 Thessalonians, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 2.2, what you have heard from me, in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This gospel, you're meant to pass it down. Meant to pass down this gospel. Wrong traditions, though. Wrong, there is such thing as wrong traditions in the scripture. Look at Mark 7:13. Let me go up a little bit further. He said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles his father and mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father and mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother. Thus, making void the word of God by your tradition, you have handed, you have handed down and, and many such things you do. This, this is explicitly saying the traditions of men are not made equal to the teachings of God. Okay. So here's, here, I think, is a helpful way to think of theology. Okay? Theology must be done within the church community. Theology must be done within the church community. In that sense, theology is a subset of ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is our doctrine of the church. Theology in general must be done within the context of the church, both presently and historically. Both presently and historically. So so what I mean by that is... um, We are not meant to do theology by ourselves on a mountain somewhere and come up with our own theological ideas. In the same way, we are not meant to live in a historical mountain and come up with our own ideas. No, we need community to think rightly, okay? We need community to think rightly. And and there is, in this sense, a way in which Theology is a form of submission as well. There's a way in which theology, there, there is submission in theology that um, there are times when we should submit ourselves theologically to others, I, myself included. So let me, let me uh, give you some scriptural support. <clears throat> Ephesians 3, 18 through 19. We already just looked at that you may the strength comprehend with all the saints. Do you see that? With all the saints. And I would say with that includes not just saints that are around me, but saints throughout church history. We are meant to comprehend the truths of the gospel and the truths of Scripture with all the saints. And by saints, I don't mean the special people that get their painting on the wall. I'm talking about all Christians. Right? Uh, This is an epistemological claim. Do you see it? Comprehend is a knowledge word. I know with all the saints. I need the community of believers, I need the community of the church to think rightly and to understand fully. Theology was never meant to be an individual task. Okay, let's look at a couple other texts. Acts 18, 24 through 28. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. Does he know the Bible? Yes. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately. Did he say things rightly? And does he know the Bible? Yes. They only knew the baptism of John. Does he know things fully? No. 
So he began to speak boldly in the synagogues. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. He, even, even a man who knew the scriptures and taught accurately, needed the community of saints to help him in his theology. Okay, let's look at Ephesians 4. What we've seen before. Christ gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints, that's all of God's people, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Until we attain, until, he gives them until we attain, here's the goal, unity of the faith. And unity of the knowledge of the Son of God until we reach mature manhood to this measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the positive. He's given the community of believers to grow us into unity around the gospel. And then here's the negative, verse 14. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. If we don't have these gifts then we will be tossed back and forth by wrong doctrine and by false teaching. We need the community of saints for that. Bavink is helpful once again here. Processing the content of Scripture dogmatically is not just the work of one individual theologian or a particular church, but the entire church throughout the ages of the whole new humanity regenerated by Christ. Now, by church, you hear he's defining church as those who have been regenerated. He's defining church as those who are truly converted, not those who aren't, who claim to be in the church. Okay, he's defining those as those who are truly converted. Let's look at a couple of their texts. 1 Timothy three fourteen. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things so that if I delay... You may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. And what is the church? It's the pillar. It holds the truth. And the buttress, it defends the truth. What is the truth? The truth is the gospel. Great indeed is the mystery of godliness that we confess the church collectively He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on the world, taken up into glory. Now the Spirit expressly says in the latter days, some will depart from the faith and devote themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. So don't be like them. Right? Don't be like them. But but if you put these things before the brothers, okay, the things that have been passed down to you, this gospel that we're confessing. If you put them before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ. Okay, let's look at John 16, 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide, so you plural, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak in His own authority. Okay, Bavink is helpful again. It is moreover of the greatest importance for every believer, particularly for the dogmatician, to know which scriptural truths under the guidance of the Holy Spirit have been brought to universal recognition by the Church of Christ. By this process, after all, the Church is kept from immediately mistaking private opinion for the truth of God. Okay, let's look at a couple others. Let's look at a couple others. Hebrews 13. 7 through 8. Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God. If you're remembering them, he's probably writing about leaders who have died, right? If you have to remember them, they're not with you. Remember them. Consider the outcome of their life. So again, they're probably dead. The outcome of their life is that they died in Christ. And imitate their faith. Okay, so this is, this is calling us to remember those who have come before us, what they've taught. Now, again, this is all within the context of what the Bible says, right? But remember them. And, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's your final hope, right? He's your final hope. All, everything rests on Him. But we should remember our leaders. Joel Beakey says this, Historical theology helps us fulfill the mandate of 
Hebrews 13, 7 through 8, to remember church leaders of the past, to imitate their faith and consider the fruit and the conduct of their labors as Jesus Christ, forever the same, works in us as he did in them. Let me look at one more verse, Proverbs eleven fourteen. 14. This is the end of the matter. In the abundance of counselors, there is safety. <laughs> In the abundance of theological counselors, there's safety. There's, there's safety in a big library. In a big library of people who people who have died and people who are still alive. There is safety in reading others. Okay, I want to look at one more text. I want to look at one more text together. Turn to Acts 15, 28 to 29. I want you to look at two verses in your groups. And compare them to each other. Acts 15, 28 through 29. And compare it to Revelation 2, 20 and 24. Compare these two to one another. And What's that? Revelation 2, 20 and 24. And Acts 15, 28 through 29. Look at those two together in your groups. Do you see any similarities between these two? So look at them together. Do you see any similarities between these two? Okay, look at Acts 15, 28. Acts 15, 28. For it has seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit to lay on you no greater burden than these. I, we're not going to lay on you any other burden than these. Revelation 2, 24. I do not lay on you any other burden. It's the exact same in the Greek. It's the exact same in the Greek. Okay? I do not lay on you any other burden. And then, what is the burden that he doesn't lay on them? Sexual morality and food sacrificed to idols. Jesus, in Revelation 2, quotes the Jerusalem Council. Right? Jesus quotes the Jerusalem Council. That's what happens. Both in the content of what he says and by saying, I don't lay on you any other burden besides this. He, he quotes it. That, that should at minimum make us see that there is quite significant, that the, the moment of the Jerusalem Council is quite a significant moment if Jesus is willing to quote it later. Did everyone see that? So, should church history play a role in our theology? Yes. But, remember three things. Yes, but remember three things. Number one, the church does not create truth. The church declares truth. The church does not create truth. The church declares truth. Okay? We don't create truth new truth. We don't discover new truth. We declare what has already been written in Scripture. That's number one. Number two, the church must always return to Scripture to affirm the truth that she declares. The church must always return to Scripture to affirm the truth, to affirm the truth that she declares. And number three, creeds and confessions carry derivative authority and not intrinsic authority. Creeds and confessions carry derivative authority and not intrinsic authority. Creeds and confessions are authoritative in as much as they confirm what Scripture has already said. Creeds and confessions are authoritative in as much as they affirm and declare what Scripture has already said. As soon as they depart from Scripture, they've lost all authority. Does that make sense? So how does it help us? How does it help us then? I think there are several ways. Number one, it protects us from repeating the same errors. So church, studying church history protects us from repeating the same errors that have come before, right? Um, creeds and confessions were formulated, especially in times of crisis for the church, and, and in those times they formulated in very specific language 
what is the truth of Scripture and what is not the truth of Scripture, right? Um, it it provides, and, and, and individual words were labored over by entire councils. We use this word and not that word. We use this word and not that word, right? So the Nicene Creed. I believe, we read it earlier today, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. It's the Athanasian Creed. We worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Spirit. This is the Catholic faith which except a man believes faithfully, he cannot be saved. So, so it, it, it protects it. All of those words are written... All of those words are written to combat heresies, to combat problems in the church. So the, the authority of creeds and confessions, in short, is less than Scripture. It's less than Scripture, but it's more than the teaching of an individual person. It's less than Scripture, but it's more than the teaching of an individual person in as much as they communicate the truth of Scripture, okay? In as much as they communicate the truth of Scripture, they carry the same weight as Scripture. In as much as they communicate the truth of Scripture, they carry the same weight as Scripture, right? We would say the same thing about preaching. If the preacher is proclaiming the Word of God, his preaching carries the same weight and authority as the Word of God. But, but if he's not, it carries no significance and no weight. And the same with tradition. The Council of Nicaea, 325 A.D., uses, people say, these, these councils are too philosophical. They're, using, they're not using Bible language, it's philosophy language. There's only one philosophical word in the Nicaean Creed, homoousios, of one substance. Everything else is not philosophical, everything else is Bible language. But... But to, the, the distinction between being a Christian and being a heretic was one letter. Homoousios versus homoousios. Homoousios, homoousios. Homoousios, the same nature as the Father. Homoousios, a similar nature to the Father. Now, that is not a paraphrase of Scripture, right? That's a summary and a theologizing from Scripture, right? Um, but if you deny that, even though it's not what the Bible says, like the Bible, the Bible does say, but it the Bible doesn't use that word. If you deny homoousios, you're not a Christian, right? So in a sense, yes, but in a sense, no, right? They are just saying, they are just saying the truths of Scripture, but they're saying, remember yesterday we talked about first reading, second reading, third reading? Homoousios is like 25th reading. But if you deny homoousios the 25th reading, then you're, you're going to deny everything that the Bible says about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Does that make sense? That's why, that's why second and third and fourth, that's why, that's why the goal of theology is not just to repeat the words on the page. If the goal of theology is to repeat the words on the page, then anyone can do it, right? The goal of theology must be more than repeating the words on the page. That's why I included my definition of systematic theology proclaiming, there's a pro, pro, proclamatory, proclamatory aspect to it. Um, does it make sense? Yeah. So let's think about the Nicene Creed again. Uh, it claims that Jesus is light from light. What does that come from? What text of scripture does that come from? Yeah, maybe John. Yeah, good. I'm the light of the world. Jesus calls himself light there, but what about light from light? How about Hebrews 1, 3, right? Oh, maybe not Hebrews 1, 3. Sorry, Hebrews. Yeah, no, Hebrews 1, 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God. So it's using scriptural language to describe the Trinity. 
As light comes from light, so the Father, so the Son comes from the Father. He's the same essence, but a different person. That's what he's saying there. Um, and they're getting that from Hebrews 1 3. Now, you might not get that immediately from Hebrews 1 3, because you're not facing Arius, who's saying the Son is a created being. But, but their context, in which Arius is saying the Son is a created being, makes them read Hebrews 1, 3, he's the radiance of the glory of God. Oh, that means he's light from light. That means he's God. Does that make sense? Any questions on that idea of the role of the church? Okay, how about the role of the pastor? The role of the pastor. We'll give two more. The role of the pastor and the role of reason. So the pastor. you think of any texts? I want you to think about this together. Are there any texts that you can think of that tell you the role of the pastor in systematic theology? Talk about that in your groups. Are there any Bible texts that talk about the role of the pastor? Talk about that in your groups. Okay, any texts that come to mind when you think of the role of the pastor? Any texts or ideas? What's the role of the pastor in systematic theology? Yeah. Um, one Good, yeah. Ephesians 4, 11 and onward. Yeah, so what would it be there? Very good, yeah. Unity and doctrine. Grow, help the church grow in unity and understanding of doctrine. Good. What else? Yeah. Uh huh. Keep a close watch on yourself, and on the teaching, right? Uh, to watch his doctrine. Good, to persist in doctrine. How about persist in good doctrine? Very good. What else? Second Timothy what? Good. Pass on good doctrine. So with that, I mean with that, so pass on. But with that is also to preserve, right? Because what, what you have heard, pass on. So this is, this is the goal, to not drop the baton, right? To not ruin what you've been given, to not change it in any way, but to, to take what you've been given and faithfully give it, which, which includes not just passing on, but preserving, right? Making sure you don't change it. Good. What else? What's that? Uh-huh. Verse 4? Oh, verse 2. Second Timothy 2.2? Oh, 2 Timothy 4, 2. Good. Preach the word, right? Very good. What's the word? Rebuke. Yeah, to rebuke with the word, right? You're doing it with the word, to re- reprove, rebuke, and exhort. What's the word? The gospel. That's exactly right, yeah, the gospel. To preach the gospel... To, re- to reprove, to rebuke, and to exhort with the gospel. Very good. Let's look at Titus 2.1. As for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Teach what accords with sound doctrine. And Titus 1.9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to instruct in sound doctrine and also give rebuke to those who contradict it. You remember, you remember the picture of the church as the pillar and the buttress of the truth? Pastors are the primary means by which the church is the pillars and the buttress of the truth. If pastors don't do this requirement, 
Um, the church, in a way, ceases to be the pillar and the buttress of the truth, right? Pastors have a really significant role in the life of the church then, and in the life of, right, the preserving good doctrine. I mean, every Christian should do it, right? Like, every Christian should try not to taint the gospel. But, but these commands, especially in the pastoral epistles, which is where we've been looking, are specifically given to pastors. Pastors have a very unique role in preserving the truth, right? Because your average church member, this is how they come to church, okay? All of you all are single. One of you soon won't be, but none of you have children, as far as I know. Um, if, if you have, this is what your average church member looks like coming to church. They've, they've struggled to get out of bed. Um, they've struggled to get their children ready that morning. Um, maybe the man and his wife got into a conflict because uh, she, uh, they're leaving 10 minutes after church started, and it's not his fault, it's her fault. Um, and then they're frustrated with each other, and then they get into church. That's, that's how your average church member comes into church, okay? They, they are ready to hear <laughs> about the gospel uh, from the one who has been learning about the gospel and is called to preserve the gospel and pass on the gospel, right? Um, that's why pastors are meant to spend their time knowing the gospel, learning the gospel, so that they can preserve and defend the gospel. Um, there's a sense in which every church member needs to do that, certainly, but it, that, that falls primarily on pastors, uh, falls primarily on pastors, which is why these, these texts about teaching, not, not every church member is called to teach the gospel, obviously. Pastors are. Uh, in the same way, not, not every, not every uh, Christian, I mean, in a sense, they're called to watch their life and their doctrine, right? But in a unique sense, pastors are to watch their life and their doctrine because the stakes are higher, Right? If you do so, you'll save yourself. Don't forget about yourself, but those who hear also, whether that be 15 people or 5,000 people, right? The stakes are high for the pastor that he preserve and watch his doctrine. Let's think about reason then, the role of reason. The role of reason. Uh, scripture is not anti-reason. Scripture is not anti-reason. Christ is called the Logos, right? John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Logos. That's a philosophical claim. That's a claim that Jesus is logic, right? Logic is, or Jesus is logic. In the beginning was the Logos. Um, and the Bible calls for reasoning. Look at Exodus 20, verse 11. In six days... The Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that's in them and rested on the seventh. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. But he's, do you see, they're, they're called to remember the Sabbath and they're given the reason for it. Right? Remember the Sabbath because God did this. That's a logical progression. Right? The scripture is written with logic in the text. There's words like therefore, for, but... And, right, what's that? Yeah, good, if then, yeah. Logic, logic then in the text is a product of inspiration. Logic in the text is a product of inspiration. Um, God calls his people to reason with him. Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together. And what is reasonable is, Stop for Israel, stop being wicked and come to me. But they're not reasoning right. Their problem, their problem is that they're reasoning wrongly. We should continue in sin. But God says to them, no, come and reason rightly, come to me. So that's important because not, not all reasoning is proper reasoning. Not all reasoning is proper reasoning. So Matthew 25, 14. It's the parable of the tenants. It'd be like a man going on a journey 
who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received five talents went at once and traded them, and he made five talents more. So also he, had, he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received only one talent went and dug it in the ground. Do you remember that? And how is he rebuked at the end, the one who dug it in the ground? He who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Bad reasoning, right? He reasoned, but he reasoned wrongly. Not what you should have done, right? Just because we're called to reason doesn't mean that all reason is right reason. And so our reasoning must be in submission to God and his word. Only then can we reason rightly. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Remember, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Um, John Frame says this, Scripture never suggests that there is any defect in human reason as such. There's no defect in human reason. The problem with reason is, is not that it is naturally unfit to examine revelation, but that it is fallen. The problem is that fallen man tries to use his reason autonomously. All his arguments are founded on the false premise that God is not the author and final standard of truth. We should not seek to be less rational or to substitute something else for reason. Rather, our reason with the rest of us should be regenerated by God's grace. Then we should learn to use reason in a new way, suited to regeneration, under the authority of our covenant Lord. Okay. So our problem is not that reason is bad. Our problem is that we reason, uh, our, our, our reason is fallen and affected by sin. But once, once we have been regenerated, we can begin reasoning rightly in line with Scripture. Let's ask this question. Okay. So we talked about sources of systematic theology. Let's talk about a couple of other random things about systematic theology that we need to discuss before we can proceed into the doctrine of revelation. Um, number one, is systematic theology possible? Is systematic theology possible? Um, systematic theology is a synthesis. It synthesizes, right? It synthesizes one uh, idea with another idea. It brings them together, and it aims to be faithful to the whole of Scripture. That means systematic theology is not Bible study, and, simple, and systematic theology is not simply, the word simply is important, not simply exegesis. It requires exegesis, but it's not simply exegesis. It's a step beyond exegesis. It's calling us to do something beyond simply exegeting the text. That means systematic theology is not word study either. Uh, it seeks to take into account all the themes of Scripture and the fruit of word study, but it's not word study. So, so, for instance, if you were doing a systematic theology of the sovereignty of God, would you include Genesis 1, 1 through 3? Okay, let's look there. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. If you're doing a, a systematic theology of the sovereignty of God, would you include this? Okay, Kamachi says yes. Does anyone say no? Of course you would include it. God wants something. He declares it to happen. And it happens. Now, the word sovereignty isn't used here. Should that be an issue? I don't think so. So just because the word isn't in the text, it's a, it's a bad theological method, I think, to look simply for where the word occurs in the text. And if the word isn't there, well, then this text isn't about that. Um, or the idea of federal headship, right? Federal headship. Um, that Adam is a covenant head, so Christ is a covenant head, so that everyone in Adam's covenant dies and everyone in Christ's covenant becomes alive. That's explicit in Romans 5, but can we get that from Genesis 4 and 5? 
Absolutely we can, right? So Genesis, and in fact, Paul does. Paul gets Romans 5 from Genesis 5, right? Um, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, after his image. It sounds like Genesis 1, right? And he named him Seth. And then Adam died, right? Um, and then Seth died. And then Enosh died, right? So we can get the idea of federal headship or, or covenant heads from this text, even though the word covenant is not used, even though the word federal headship isn't used, um, we can get those ideas from texts, even if the word isn't used in the text. So, so that means that just because um, you've done a word study, you've gone to a website and you've searched for all the occurrences of goodness in the Bible, you know everything the Bible has to say about the goodness of God. No, you don't. Theology is far more than just repeating the words on the page. If theology is only repeating on the words of the page, um, that's, that's, uh, that's far less than what could be said in Scripture. Does that make sense? That's a really, that's a basic point, but it's a really important point. Um, so systematic theology then seeks to also, it, so it seeks to say, to say what does all of Scripture say, even when that word isn't used, okay, even when that word isn't used. So like, for instance, I, I had a student once who, um, he was trying to, he was trying to determine when, when the church began, right? So our, our statement of faith says that the church is all of the elect people of all time. That's what our statement of faith says. So that, that brings the church, that, that means that Adam is the first member of the church. That's what that means. That's what our statement of faith says. And, and this guy um, was able to find the word ecclesia, which is the word for church, uh, mentioned all the way back to the formation of the nation of Israel, but not before it. And so he's like, I think the church started in, in the Exodus story but not before that, because the word ecclesia isn't used before that. And I was like, my friend, that's, that's just bad theological method. Like, just because the word isn't used doesn't mean that the idea isn't there, right? There's so much more that informs your theology besides word study. Um, if, if all we're doing is word study, um, we're not doing theology, right? Um, there's so much more involved in that. So, so for instance, how about, how about this? The the, the idea of deacons, okay? So the idea of deacons, deacon, uh, diakona in, in, in Greek uh, is the idea of a table waiter. It's a table waiter. That's how it's used in, in um, that's how it's used in secular literature. It's a table waiter. Uh, it's a serotania, right? A deacon is a serotania. Um, now, are there any texts in the Old Testament maybe where the idea of table waiter is used? But the word deacon is not used. There's a really big one that the early church made a really big deal of. The Jews made a really big deal of. Can you think of a time in which a really important character of the Bible served a table? Before that, if you think about Old Testament, how about Abraham with the three visitors? So a lot of the church fathers will look at that text and find applications towards deacons. The Jews did too. But the word deacon's not used there, but the idea of a table waiter is. Okay? So is that good theological method or bad? I think it's good theological method. The word deacon doesn't have to be in the text for us to because the idea of being a table waiter is. Right? Um, now, that's not going to be my primary text I go to when I talk about deacons. But it is going to be a text that I'll go to. Or how about Jesus in Mark? The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. That's a, a verb that comes from the idea of deacon, right? A deacon is a servant. So, so the idea of a deacon starts not in Acts chapter 6, but in Christ who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many, right? There's so much more that goes into theological method than basic word study, is what that means. And the goal of theology is not just to repeat the words on the page, which is why the Nicene Creed, begotten, not made, is good theology. Not made 
begotten certainly in the New Testament, begotten not made, is not a New Testament formulation. It's a synthesis, right? Or being of the same substance of the Father. Not quoting the New Testament, we're synthesizing, right? So theology is far more than just repeating the words on the page. Any question on that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can. We can search the word and the idea in the Old Testament to come to give us images, I think. Yeah. Um, so, so, for instance, I think good systematic theology, good systematic theology um, can say that uh, a ministry of the Holy Spirit is accompanying the word preached and making it effective. Okay? Um, and we see that throughout the New Testament. But we can go to Genesis 1, where God said, let there be light, and the Holy Spirit, who was hovering over the waters, made that word effective, right? Now, that's not a text about preaching, but we can take that idea of preaching and bring that into the Old Testament, I think. I think that's good theological method. That's, that's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, 207th reading. That's all I'm talking about, you know? I, I read once, I make conclusions, I read in light of those conclusions, I read again, I read again, I read again. And sometimes my, I find out my conclusions are wrong, but I'm always reading in light of my conclusions. And that, that shows me some of the depth of Scripture. That's not, that doesn't mean I don't care about what the text says, but theology is not just repeating the words on the page. In the same way, preaching isn't just repeating the words on the page. If that's all I'm doing, um, that's, anyone can, anyone can repeat the words on the page, right? The goal of preaching and the goal of theology is far beyond that. So preaching is, our systematic theology is built on exegesis, but it's not simply exegesis. Any questions on that? That's a, quite a big, that's going to be important later. Okay, so that's number one, is that it seeks, it seeks to be faithful to the text, and it seeks to apply different theological categories to texts that don't necessarily use the specific word that we find in that theological category, right? Um, number two, though, it seeks to, it seeks to synthesize by, um, by looking at texts with apparent contradictions and, and tries to be faithful to the whole of Scripture. So, for instance, let's look at John 19, 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. I thirst. How can that be true if John 1.1 1, 1 is true? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him, not anything was made that was made. In Him is life. How can the one in whom life dwells be thirsty? Well, systematic theology tries to come up with language to answer that question, right? And, and the way the church has answered that is the word, um, the word's hypostatic union. Jesus is truly God and truly man. Truly God and truly man simultaneously. So that the person experiences things that are consistent with both natures, right? Um, so systematic theology is, is using a word and using theological ideas to try to synthesize those apparent contradictions, even though the words hypostatic union are not in the text, right? In fact, try, try to find a text, another, you can synthesize text, try to find a text that says fully God, I'm sorry, truly God and truly man. That formulates it in the way that the Athanasian Creed does. It, it, there isn't one, right? But we're taking this text and this text and this text and this apparent contradiction, this apparent contradiction, and we're bringing them together and we're coming with words to describe it. The active obedience of Christ. You're never going to find those words in Scripture. Does that mean that idea isn't true? No. That absolutely does not mean that. Theology is far more than just repeating the words on the page. Theology is more than exegesis. Questions on that? That's quite, it's quite important in you know, the rest of our systematic theology classes. So what? 
This is important because all revelation comes from one divine mind. All revelation comes from one divine mind. And so therefore, Scripture does not contradict itself. Unlike the neo-Orthodox, and unlike the liberals who would say there are contradictions in Scriptures. Um, so for instance, it wants you within neo-evangelicalism, questioning the unity of the Bible's message applied to theology. Um, there, or even evangelicals. Let's talk about evangelicals. Questioning the integrity of textual synthesis. There are, there are evangelicals who would question the integrity of, of, of textual synthesis. There's a debate between what's more faithful, biblical theology or systematic theology. Right? Biblical theology or systematic theology, what's more faithful? Um, Genesis 6.6 6 is an example. God repented that he made man. God repented that he made man. But, um, 1 Samuel 15.29, the glory of Israel will not lie, that's God, will not lie or have regret, for he's a man that he should have regret. Yeah, Genesis 6.6, 6, The Lord regretted that he made man. So what's true? Does God regret or does not God not regret? What's true? Both. Now if you're, no? They're both not true. One's true. Oh, okay. you're just shaking your head. <laughs> I thought you were disagreeing. I, I think what we are meant to pull away from here is that God does regret but not in the way that man regrets. He regrets, but not in the way that man regrets. His experience of regret is not the same as us. Our experience of regret is, I did something. I wish I had never done it. I'm going to do whatever I can to make it as if I had never done it. That's what God does in the flood, right? And the best way to describe that in human words is God regretted. But his experience of regret can't be like our experience of regret, because for God, something never, God never has the experience of something happening that he didn't know was going to happen, and so I wish I had done it differently. So God's experience of regret can't be the same as ours, but it is of a genuine experience, right? Um, so, so systematic theology seeks to, to, to bring all of these ideas together. So because revelation comes from one divine mind, we're able to do this. Yeah. I would say, not, not the way we do, not the way we do, right? Beyond that, um, I would say that, um, so we'll learn about this in her hermeneutics, but there's, a, there's an idea called anthropomorphic language, anthropomorphic language. So for instance, <clears throat> the Bible says that God has eyes, God has eyes that go throughout the earth. I've never seen big old eyeballs going up throughout the earth, right? Um, the Bible says that God has a mighty right hand, right? I've never seen God's mighty right hand. Um, so what does it mean that God has a hand? What does it mean that God has eyes? The Bible talks about God's mouth or God's finger. Um, obviously, God doesn't have a body like we do. God is spirit, is what Jesus says. And those who worship him, worship in spirit and in truth. So they're metaphors. They're metaphors for God. I think the regretting is similar to that, right? God doesn't have emotions like we do because he doesn't have a body. Emotions are, I mean, they're part of the immaterial part of us, but they're, they're physiological as well, right? They're, they're chemical reactions in our brain to things that happen to us. Um, so God's regret can't be like our regret just because he doesn't have a body, right? God, God does not know what it's like. So for me, if I, let's say that I've just had a really frustrating day, right? Like, and, and on the way home, like, <clears throat> it takes me, like, three hours to get home because of traffic, and then the car breaks down, and then um, someone jumps into the taxi ahead of me and just, oh, my goodness gracious, I cannot get home today. And I, I get home, and, um, you know, one of my kids walks up to me and, like, I don't know, just, like, punch me in the leg or something just to be silly. And I'm like, what are you doing? Okay, what... I'm overreacting for that moment, obviously. Do you, do you know why I feel it as strongly as I do and not laughing? Because for the past three hours, the chemicals in my body have just been pumping and raging, right? 
So there's a, there's a physiological element to our emotions that God can't have. God doesn't know what that's like. Jesus knows what that's like, but God doesn't know what that's like, right? The Father doesn't know what that's like. The Spirit doesn't know what that's like. So God can't have emotions like our emotions, but he does have experiences that are best understood in light of the emotions that we have. Um, you'll talk more about that in your theology prop, proper class, but um, yeah, it's the, the, the flood story is best understood through the lens of what regretting feels like. But God doesn't regret like we do. Does that make sense? Kind of? Still working on it? Welcome to the club. So, so revelation comes from one divine mind, which means it's consistent, right? Um, the one divine mind never changes. The one divine mind never makes mistakes. And so the source of our theology and scripture is unified. It's unified. Um, so, so we must, we must then, this is the task of the theologian, okay? This is the task of the theologian in this, is when, when we see texts which seem to contradict each other, our goal is not to create unity between them. Our goal is not to create unity between them. Our goal is to trace the unity that God intends in them. Our job is not to fix apparent contradictions. Our job is to recognize the unity of the divine mind behind the apparent contradictions. Our job is to think God's thoughts after him. That's our job, to think God's thoughts after him. So let's finish then, unless there are any questions on that. Let's finish with requirements for doing systematic theology. And then after lunch, we'll get into the doctrine of revelation. Mm-hmm. Requirements for doing systematic theology. And almost everything I say, Jeff Perswell stands behind it. But this, this section is especially uh, thanks to him. Requirements for doing systematic theology. Number one is humility. Humility. Because knowledge can make us proud. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowledge puffs up. The context of this text is is certain people who seem to have spiritual knowledge and are claiming that they have special knowledge. And, And Paul answers this in two ways. First, he says, you don't know as much as you think. Verse 2. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not know as he ought to know. Okay? You don't know as much as you think you know. Okay? Let that be your warning. Let that be my warning. You don't know as much as you think you know. Okay? And then in verse 3, the true prize is not knowing. The true prize is being known by God. The true prize is not knowing. The true prize is being known by God. So we need humility because knowledge can tend to make us proud. And we need to remember that the most, the biggest prize is being known by God. Number two, humility because we're dependent on God for everything. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you have not received? What do you have that you have not received? There's, there's no such thing as inherent ability. Everything is a gift from God. If you're more theologically inclined, what do you have that you've not received? If, if you're not theologically inclined, but you've, you've really worked hard to learn, what do you have that you've not received? Well, we, we are speaking only about things that we've received. We're speaking only about things that we've received. Number three, humility, because theology is incomplete and imperfect. Our theology is incomplete and imperfect. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. For now we see in a mere dimly, but we will see face to face. 
Now I know in part, but one day I will know fully, even as I have been fully known, right? And that's not our present experience. So, so quantitatively, it's limited. It's in a mirror, and it's dim. Quantitatively, it's limited. It doesn't have everything that we don't have everything that we could have. Not everything that could be said is something that we know. But it's also qualitatively limited, right? It's not only that we see in a mirror versus face to face, but we see in a mirror um, and we know in part, right? So it's qualitatively limited too. We don't know everything that could possibly be known. So that, that doesn't mean our theology is untrue, okay? That doesn't mean our theology is not true, but it does mean this, our theology is always incomplete. Our theology is always incomplete. And simply because we know in part, okay, get this, because we know in part doesn't mean that we don't know. Just because we know in part doesn't mean that we don't know. We don't have to know everything to know something, because God knows everything, and we can trust him with what he's revealed to us. But there are, if we think back to Deuteronomy, what is it, 6, 9? The secret things belong to the Lord, but what's been revealed is for us and for our children, that we might do them. There are things which the Lord has chosen to withhold from us. They're secret things that we can never know. And so we shouldn't, it's the secret things aren't like things that we can get by like a prophecy or a dream or a vision. No, the secret things are in contrast to what has been revealed. There are things that God has revealed and things that he's chosen not to reveal. And that should produce in us great humility. Um, because the theological debates that we have, um, even within our own position, while we can be pretty confident that what we're saying is true. We, we really need to hold all of our theological positions with great humility because we may get to heaven one day and find out that we were wrong. We may get to heaven one day and find out that we were reading that verse wrong or that there was actually an entire chapter or books written about that very thing and we didn't even see that theme in the book. It's very possible. It's very possible that we'll get to heaven and... Uh, and we'll be like, my goodness, I, I, how, could I, how could I have been so stupid? And in fact, that will certainly happen. Um, so that's number one, is humility. Uh, number two is submission. Okay, submission. Submission to what's revealed in Scripture. Submission was revealed in Scripture. So I gave this example before, but remember the example I gave you. Um, I was reading, I was talking to a guy who was asking me about divine election. I read Romans 9, and he said to me, uh, I know my God isn't like that. All I did was read the verse. And he said, I know my God isn't like that. Oh, I didn't even explain the text. Um, I was teaching a class once on Ephesians. It wasn't here. Teaching a class on Ephesians, and, and all, all I did was read Ephesians 1, verse 3. I'm sorry, Ephesians 1, verse, verse 4. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And I woke up, or I, I didn't wake up. I looked up, and there was a guy in the front row just shaking his head. All I did was read the words on the page. And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know who you're disagreeing. Sounds like you're disagreeing with Paul, not me. All I did was read the words. Um, there was one time, um, there was one time that um, there was a guy who asked me, uh, is it possible to resist God's drawing people? Is it possible for God to draw someone and they not come to him? And I, I just read John 10, my sheep hear my voice, and they come to me. In John 6, everyone whom the Father draws will come to him. All I did was read the verses, and the guy said, oh, I'm not a Calvinist. I didn't say anything about Calvinism. I just read, I just read the words on the page. Um, I'll give you one more example. Ephesians 4. Um, 
was in a class in seminary, and uh, we were going through Ephesians in Greek. It was a Greek, it was a class on Ephesians in Greek, and I, I asked about this word in verse 13, uh, mekri, until. Um, so I noted that, that there are these gifts given, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, until. Right, they're given until we attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Right? So all these gifts are given until that happens. So I asked the guy, I asked my teacher, I said, it sounds like, first of all, that these, these gifts are in a single list. Uh, there's not division in the list, right? Uh, apostles and prophets aren't in a separate category in the list. And two, they're given until a certain time period. So they're going to cease when this happens, and it seems like this hasn't happened yet. And, um, I mean, in one sense, the guy was humble, but what he said was, I, I, don't, I just don't have a theological category for this. And then he said, I, I think we live in a time period, a period of redemptive history that Paul didn't anticipate ever happening. I think what he means by that is the Bible is wrong. <laughs> Um, I think, so with that, we, we must submit to what the text says. Whatever the text says, we have to say it's true. What, whatever the text says is true. But that's number two. Number three, we have to have a desire to apply the text. We have a desire to apply the text. God gives us his word that we might enter into a relationship with him. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Okay. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do the words of the law. Why has he revealed things to us? So that we might do them. He's revealed things to us so that we might do them. He gives us his word so we might live in right relationship with him. So, so God gives us, James 1.22 affirms this. Okay? Be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. Okay? He gives us his word that we might obey, that we might apply. So we are most... He, we're most vulnerable to spiritual pride when we're not obeying God's word. We are most vulnerable to spiritual pride when we're not obeying God's word because we're not allowing God's word to have its full effect in our lives. If we're obeying the clear commands of Scripture, then we're not going to be as subject to spiritual pride. Okay? And to not obey is to delude Scripture. To not obey is to delude Scripture. When the Scripture is clear on what it says, and we don't obey it, um, we are deluding Scripture, and in this text, we're deceiving ourselves. Number four is dependence on the Holy Spirit. Dependence on the Holy Spirit. Second, 1 Corinthians 2, 9-16. As is written, what do I has seen or ear heard or the heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love him? People think that's about heaven. That's not about heaven. You know that, right? What no eye has seen or ear heard nor the heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love him? These things, right? The things God has prepared for those who love him. God has revealed to us through the Spirit. That's the gospel. What has God prepared for those who love him? Salvation in Christ. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the Spirit of that person, which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Do you see the analogy? Here's the analogy. So it could be, it could be, um, it could be that a doggy, doggy says, I don't like pizza crust, right? I love pizza, but I hate pizza crust, Okay. And so we just hear that all the time. So he never eats his pizza crust. We, we, maybe we go out to eat for pizza as a 
pastor's college, and he's just like, I'm not going to eat the pizza crust. I'm not going to do it. And then one day, you know, Doggy has this big, maybe, uh, bag under his bed. You know, and then ne- next thing you know, it turns into two bags and three bags and four. You know, I don't know what's in his bags. I don't know. You know what it is? One day you find out it's pizza crust. He just has like 10 bags worth of pizza crust on it because he says he doesn't like pizza crust, but actually he just, he's like a pizza crust hoarder. Okay, that might happen one day. Okay, well, none of us would know until we find out. But, but that's what Paul's saying, right? That's a silly analogy. But no one knows the spirit, a person's thought except the spirit of that person. No one knows what a person truly thinks except for the person himself, right? If Doggy loves pizza crust and hoards pizza crust, no one knows that except for him. So also, no one's able to comprehend the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. You see the, the parallel? Only the Spirit is able to tell us what God's thoughts are. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us. Right? That what he's saying is, only a person understands themselves the Spirit of God is the only one who understands God, but we have received the Spirit of God so that we can understand Scripture rightly. Those things which we know about God are revealed to us by His Spirit. And, and here's, here's a really, whew, this should produce all kinds of humility in us. The difference between accepting and rejecting the truths of Scripture is not our intellect, It's not our ability. It's not our training. It's the Spirit. It's the Spirit who makes us willing. Abraham Kuyper says this, The Holy Spirit has not merely given us a book and then withdrawn himself from the human scene of action, but the same Holy Spirit continues to be our leader. And that very freedom of action of our spirit causes his dominion to triumph. So we, we need the Holy Spirit. With that, then, um, the goal of systematic theology is ultimately relational. The goal of systematic theolo- theology is ultimately relational. Jeremiah 9, 23. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, Let not the mighty man boast in his might, Let not the rich man boast in his riches, But let him who boasts boast in this, he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. The, the goal, the goal then, is relational, to know God, to know God. Fifthly and finally, desire to teach. Desire to teach. There's, there's a sense, there's a sense in which our systematic theology is incomplete until it's verbalized to the community. Well, we already saw Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, right? We've seen that many, many times. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, he's given the pastors and the teachers for the building up of the body of God. Um, but look at Matthew 28. 19 through 20, right? Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Now, it'd be hard, it'd be certainly hard to do, or Paul in Acts 20 who who says, I did not shy away from teaching you the whole counsel of God. It's certainly hard to teach everything that God says or everything that Jesus has commanded without doing some kind of synthesizing, right? So implied there is that uh, theology is meant to serve the church. Theology is meant to serve others. Theology, the theologian who just sits in his tower by himself reading a bunch of books, uh, his theology is incomplete. Theology reaches its full intended effect when, it's, when it builds up the church and what saves the lost. Any questions on that? 
Good, yeah. So that, what, what they're doing there is second reading, right? They've, they've read the text once, determined what justification is, and they go back to the text, reading the text in light of those conclusions. Um, some of them, for some of them, justifi- their definition of justification is wrong, right? I think a new perspective is, on Paul is wrong in their definition of justification. Um, I think, and, and I think that returning to the text um, proves that. Um, but their method isn't necessarily wrong, right? In the sense that they're doing second reading. Second reading is very good. I do second reading. But that's why we, we almost, we, whenever we do second reading, third reading, fourth reading, we're always returning to the scripture and testing our conclusions. Does that make sense? Yeah, good question. There's hardly a day that goes by. I don't quote this to myself. John 15, 5. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Repeat that to yourself every day. And eventually it starts to sink in. And if you really believe that, uh, that apart from Christ you could do nothing, that, 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 that makes you very dependent on the Holy Spirit. Very good question.